Well, I had friends when I was in high school in preferred activities like horseback riding, electronics, or model rockets. And there's a tendency sometimes to just go, go on and on and on talking about the same thing. And this is where someone had to tell me. You're going to tell that story twice, and that's all that people are going to want to hear it. They're going to get bored with it after uh, hearing it tw uh, more than twice. Give them say, hey, you know, you've talked too much about that robot. Let's talk about something else. Well, let's give some examples of things that are not perfect. Okay, if a photographer is working for the National Geographic, that would be at the pinnacle of photography career. But if you go through the National Geographic, you're probably going to find some technical errors like flare in some of the pictures. But overall, such a great picture, even though it had flare, you still use the picture. Also, if he's a science kid, bring up the concept of absolute zero, where all atomic motion is stopped. You can never get there, you can only approach it. You know, get the concept across of work up to a certain standard. It doesn't have to be perfect, it's got to be up to a certain standard. Well, when I was a young kid, there were expectations for doing things that other people want. It gets back to turn-taking. Uh, yeah, I had to sit through church even though I thought it was boring. But that's something the other members of the family wanted to do. And there were expectations for me not to be disruptive. And most of the time I behave. You know, and that's just one step beyond turn-taking in board games. You've got to learn to get your turn. Sometimes you get to pick out the movie, Another time, son, brother or sister may pick out the movie we go to. Well, one of my really important teachers, Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, and he had interesting projects for me to do. And I worked on all kinds of stuff with optical illusions. And that actually helped me in some of my cattle work because it made me pay attention to what the animals were seeing. And then that was uh, that doing interesting science projects got me motivated to study because now I had a reason for studying. Studying was a way to get to a goal of becoming a scientist. This is where a good teacher really turns a student around. Well, there's a lot of problems in the sensory system. Distorted input, sort of like uh, pictures pixelating with a bad satellite dish, uh, uh, audio cutting in and out like a really bad cell phone, uh, a lot of the sensory systems are not working normally. In my book, The Autistic Brain, I've got a whole big section in there on sensory issues. And there's an interesting new study that's come out called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. Now, I want to make it very clear, this does not replace ABA or speech therapy. It is an adjunct. And what's done in this, and there's a paper you can get online called Environmental Enrichment is Effective Treatment for Autism. You stimulate two senses at the same time, like maybe you do an aromatherapy, a cinnamon, something like that, touch carpet. You always change, always changing the pair of senses that you stimulate. And one of the senses is always one of the more primitive senses, smell, touch, or balance. So there's a lot of emphasis on eight different aromatherapies, and the people were, um, children were, were uh, evaluated baseline. Controls got ABA and speech therapy. Experimentals got this additional sensory therapy. And then after uh, quite a few months, they evaluated them again. And the experimental group that had the treatment had significantly better behavior. This is a refereed scientific journal article. And it uses simple household things, very simple to do. Environmental enrichment is an effective treatment for autism. You can download it online. I'll tell you some things not to do. Don't say you went to sleep, because then the child might be afraid that you went to sleep. I, when I was very young, uh, we were out for a walk and came across a very flat squirrel in the middle of the road that had been run over. And it was very clear that the squirrel could not be put back together again. And that made me learn not to run out in the street, because I wouldn't want to be like that squirrel. And there's no way the veteran, veterinarian could do surgery and put him back together again. I mean, basically, um, you know, death of a person, they are gone. They are gone. Well, I, Oliver Sacks is a very kindly uh, kind of professor type of person. And uh, 
I read an article he wrote in the New York Times just before he died about, you know, the going back doing the Jewish Sabbath. And at the end of the article he was talking about, well, if A, then B, then C, which way of his life could have gone down different paths. And I started really weeping when I read that article. You know, and I'm glad it went down the path that, you know, where our paths crossed. I could barely print it out, I was so um, upset. No, uh, fortunately, um, he was writing right up until the end. And he's uh, overall really satisfied with his life. Well, after the article appeared in the New Yorker magazine, uh, shortly after that, an agent uh, appeared that suggested that I ought to write a book. And that's what brought the book Thinking in Pictures into being. I'm Candace Cameron Bray. Tom Berger on. You're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. You're watching Autism Live. So thank you for joining us. We're here with The Future is Bright, and we have a very special guest, Temple Grandin. Doctor, thank you for joining us. We're it's so excited good to, be here. to have you. Thank you. You just gave a great speech at the 46th annual conference here in Denver, Colorado, and we would love to take an opportunity to just ask you a couple of questions okay. about a hot topic for you now that is employment yep. and helping people with autism become gainfully employed and what we can do as they're growing up uh, you know, through the high school years and through those younger years, maybe before they're old enough to get a real job as you'd call it, what's your advice for parents out there and what they can do with their kids today to help them? The problem with autism is since they changed the guidelines for diagnosis in 2013, the spectrum has become extremely broad. At one end of the spectrum you're going to have Silicon Valley programmers, you know, really good artists, I mean really talented people, and at the other end of the spectrum you're going to have someone that's going to remain nonverbal with some very severe handicaps and it's all got the same word. You see, if you diagnose a kid with dyslexia, you still have a fully verbal kid with normal intelligence, can't read. ADHD, you know, you've got the hyperactivity attention problems. It's a much narrower spectrum if someone is ADHD or they're um, dyslexic. Autism now, you've got this huge quagmire of a spectrum. And the only time I can give a specific recommendation across all spectrum is that a kid's two and a half or three with no speech you must start early intervention, 20 hours a week of one-on-one -on -one teaching. Uh, there's various ABA and other methods that work, but you've got to start, you've got to start now. I can give you a canned answer. But once a child gets older, they're kind of going, merging into three different groups. What are the groups? Well, you're going to have a kid that's going to remain nonverbal with very severe handicaps. And some of the ones that look very low functioning actually have a locked-in syndrome with normal intelligence inside. Okay. Then you have a moderate group where you've got some speech, but it isn't really normal speech. Reading might be, you know, fourth grade level, sort of like that. And then you've got the high-end group where they often are really smart in one thing, like math okay. or art or maybe verbal, and then they have a deficit in another thing. And the education system puts too much emphasis on the deficits, not enough, build, not enough emphasis in building up the area of strength. Mm -hmm. If you've got a third grader that's good in math, let's give them harder math and let's introduce them to programming. Okay. Because that's something that could turn into a job. You know, the programs that are hot right now are C++ and JavaScript, Ruby and Python. The courses are free online. But the kid's not going to get interested in that unless you introduce it. And who should be doing that? How do you recognize that you've got a kid with, let's say, a great math capability or great well, All right, so the kid, you should give the kid the third grade math. He instantly learns it. Let's get the fourth grade book out. Okay. Let's get the fifth grade book out. Let's get the sixth grade book out. If he can do the college book in third grade, fine, let him. Okay. He's probably going to need special ed. So reading. very early. Oh, yeah. Don't make him do baby math. He's going to get bored, and I guarantee you he'll be a gigantic behavior problem when he's bored. It, it sounds like you think there might be a little bit of a coddling issue where parents are concerned. Well, I think there's a big coddling issue on just learning things like greeting. I'm really appalled at meetings where um, come to a meeting. Here is a 12-year-old completely and fully verbal that does not know how to shake hands. He doesn't know how to greet. You see, the manners in the 50s were taught in a much more structured way. Right. And teachable moments were used. Like if I picked up my potatoes uh, with my hand, and I'm not french fries, but mashed potatoes with my hand, mother would say, use the fork. Okay. She didn't scream no, she'd say, use the fork. That's a teachable Healthy moment. Healthy alternative. And, and um, I was at a very fancy dinner one time at a college, and there was a 12-year-old kid there, fully verbal, 
and the, um, uh, he started to eat the food with his hands. And I just said, this is a fancy dinner. You're not eating like that in front of me. Use the utensils. And he did. So it's I just I just gave the instruction. But you give the instruction. I didn't yell at him. You give the instruction. But there's a tendency to overprotect. I'm seeing too many fully verbal kids who don't know how to shop. Sure. Uh, they're not doing any chores in the home. Just basic things. Greeting people. When I was eight years old, mother had me party hostess at her parties. And I had to greet the guests and serve the snacks. So it sounds like your mother had a lot of faith in your ability to just take those tasks that she was giving you and do them. Well, and she you're just, saying, you got to stretch these kids. Stretch you see, them. the kids okay. getting labeled autistic to babying them. And, and uh, you know, if you have a little kid, you know, that's, uh, you know, severe behaviors. I was severe behaviors when I was three years old. Sure. You know, of course, the parents are going to be upset about that. But then you got another kind of kid, 10 years old, no friends, geeky and nerdy, gets a label and not enough's being done to engage his area of strength sure. and teach him basic skills. Because what makes me crazy is I go back and forth between different silos. I'll do a talk out at Silicon Valley. You can go to the big tech companies. It's Asperger's everywhere, cube okay. after cube full of them. <laughs> Headphones okay. clamped on, don't even look up at you. I can go over to the meatpacking plants. There's a whole shop full of hippies there, and I know they're on the spectrum. Okay. They've been there for years. This is what makes me crazy when I go out in the cattle world or the tech world or even the academic world and I find um, uh, older people my age maybe 10 years old that are on the spectrum but they're okay. not diagnosed. So it sounds like you're saying t in today's society less helicopter parenting That's right. and more you know you must do this and, and reinforcing these are the manners you need this is how well, we you just treat them you got to move them just outside the comfort zone. I, I just met okay. a lady when I was down in Argentina I said, well, I can only shop at this one supermarket, this one newsstand. I can't go to another store. You know what I did with her? We watched Took out of that somewhere. meeting, and we went to a new newsstand. So and I brought through. her up to it, and I said, buy that magazine there. She wrung her hands a little bit, and she bought it. Okay. You so know, you made someone else walk through the proverbial I did. door. Good for That's you. Right. That's what I did. I did that last week. And you're encouraging parents to do the same thing with their kids And then now. we're going to be getting into looking at the job front. Okay, now that's something you just gave a great speech about. And it sounds like that's this new hot topic for you about how kids in their maybe early teens, maybe before they're really able to get formal jobs, should be out doing maybe the paper route type equivalent. Okay, we don't have paper routes anymore. In fact, I got asked. The equivalent. This, I got asked the other day what a paper route is. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. And By I, adult? I said, well, you know, they used to have children <laughs> deliver newspapers to people's sure. houses, and that taught really valuable skills. Okay. Okay. Now we don't have that today. But How what's about the equivalent? walking some dogs for the neighbors? You can do that in the city. Okay. You know, but not your own dogs. Somebody else's dogs, and you got to go over that at two different apartments at six o'clock in the morning, take those dogs out, and walk them every day, even when the weather's nasty, or maybe um, I. Uh, Working in the farmer's market, okay, we were just discussing uh, New York City where my mother lives when I stay at the hotel in New York And I walk six blocks to my mother's apartment. I go by, by five or six street vendors okay. okay, a kid that's like 12 or 13 years old have them help out a street vendor They've got to start learning work skills if they're on the suburbs. They could help sure. out in the farmer's market okay. Let's start getting creative uh, Let's start off with church and synagogue jobs things like that church ushers setting up chairs for the church social mm -hmm. yes it's a job every thursday night you got to do those chairs so it's the accountability being somewhere where someone's expecting you to help out and do a particular so thing it's a defined task you got a okay. hundred chairs to put up defined and you got a hundred chairs you're gonna have to put away after the event is over so defined and repetitive and something that they do well in, in a lot of jobs are repetitive. The newspaper routes are repetitive but Let's go through my work history. These okay. kids have got to learn work skills outside the home before they graduate my school. Okay. All right, when I was 13, mother just in the neighborhood found a little seamstress that uh, okay. did dressmaking out of her home. And she went in and told about me. I was kind of different, sure. and, but I was really good at hand sewing. So the lady started having me hand sew the hems and take apart dresses. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. Okay. Then when I got a little bit older, I was making signs and selling them. And the first sign I ever made was for a beauty shop. Uh, first sign I ever made for a customer. I had made some other signs before okay. that. But making things, and you have to learn how to make signs that other people want. And then even when I was getting my master's, I was making signs. So the letting, carnival. Letting and then my kids. aunt's ranch. At my aunt's ranch, there was some work stuff. I had to take guests out on trail rides, and I had okay. to, she had guests there. I had to wait so on tables there, too. you were accountable. You were given yep. various tasks, and you were accountable. It sounds like that you're endorsing that we have our kids go out there when they're younger and do these 
you know, smaller jobs for people in the neighborhood or small business owners and learn those skills before they get okay, to the job Okay, now some related. states you can work in safe retail at 14. Okay. Okay, a lot of other states at 16. Well, you know, let's say you got a friend of two blocks away, like a little tax accounting office. Sure, sure. They can put the kid to work in there. Perfect. You know, yeah, you know, cash economy. Something. They've got to learn work skills. And look, just look at the things they're in. Maybe it's a little snow, a little Something. coffee stand that's in the neighborhood. And the kid, when he's 12, can go help out with that. And he's expected there at certain hours every week. It's a job. Okay. And so that's the importance of it all, is just they to get them out there. They've got to learn how to work. And when I was uh, 14, I got kicked out of school for fighting and throwing a book. Went to a very expensive boarding school. Spent three years of that time running off a horse barn and cleaning horse stalls. And what Mr. Patey, the headmaster, realized, I was learning job skills. That was super important. Which and then when you? I finally got interested in science and studying, I kind of did a year of high school in a year. Okay. But I had took, but I had been working in the horse barn, I had learned that the responsibility. Every afternoon, you got to clean every stall, put yep. them in and out, feed them. So it's responsibility. Have our That's parents right. allow their kids to get out there and just not be afraid to do it before they, they get. They got to get out. Okay. And the project search research has shown very clearly that working in a real job the whole year before they graduate from high school is very, very important for for, for keeping employment for, uh, after they graduate. Okay, so along those same lines, now you've got a group of kids in today's society who have gotten out there and let's say worked at these little carts or s local small businesses informally while yeah. they're younger and they get older and they're able to get into the workforce, they need to get there. You gotta get to your job. So you have to be able to drive if you can, if you're capable of driving. Talk to us about your stance on well, driving. Well, driving was essential for me. I would have never been able to go into the cattle industry without driving. There's a scene in the movie where I get kicked out of Scottsdale Feed Yard. I was yep. driving. It was beautiful. If I hadn't have been driving, <laughs> I wouldn't have gone to Scottsdale Feed Yard to get kicked out of it. Yep. And so how did I learn to drive? How? On my aunt's ranch, yep. we were three miles to go up to the mailbox and three miles back. And she started having me drive up to the mailbox on a dirt road. Well, over the whole summer, that was six miles a day, six days a week, I put 200 miles on that truck driving just on this dirt road. Just to pick up the mail. Just to pick up the mail. <laughs> That's what we had to do. That's the way okay. it was on the ranch. The mailbox was three miles away. Okay. So that was 200 miles of driving. That's a tank of gas. And I hadn't been near any serious traffic at that point. Okay. Um, I think what you need to be doing is burning up a tank of gas in a totally safe place. Country dirt roads, giant big deserted parking lots, or open dry flat fields because there are some multitasking issues, and what the kid needs to do is he's got to learn how to operate that car before we go near any traffic. And the problem with driver's ed is they put them into traffic too fast. Mm -hmm. So I want to burn up this tank of gas in a totally safe place, then you do the driver's ed. Okay. So they fully learn how to steer, brake, stop. You can practice parking, practice all kinds of stuff, because this deals with the problems with executive function and multitasking. See, when you learn a motor skill like driving, you first of all have to think about how to steer, how to brake, and how to use the gas. Mm -hmm. Now, as you practice it, you no longer have to think about it. It just goes in your motor cortex. Sure. Well, before we go near any traffic, I want operation of the car migrated into the motor cortex of the brain. So once that's second nature, and a, and a kid goes out there and is learning how to drive on, let's say, this deserted road yeah, or this open right. parking lot, and they've got steering down, and you want to maybe throw some things into the mix before they ever go into driver's ed. like. It's raining, there's windshield wipers, and you need to look at your turn signal and, oh, by the way, you're about to park, those types of well, things. Well, then you start teaching them how to use the turn signals. Teach them everything. You just teach them everything. And and um, and then even after I got a car, I went to Franklin Pierce College, but that was on out in the country. There was some traffic, but it was really mild traffic. So I was another year on easy roads before I did any really serious traffic. Also, um, like downtown Denver, I just absolutely hate coming here. I actually avoid the rush hour, but you see the airport route, I know exactly where the lanes are, where I have okay. to get over. It's a more comfortable uh, route. The airport's totally comfortable. Okay. You know, so like going to the airport's easy, and see all my agricultural jobs were out in the country, so. Sure. But, but even on Denver traffic, okay, I would learn a certain route. There's some really bad exits where you can get forced off. Yep. Well, then I gotta learn where I gotta get over when I'd learn the route. Um, but it's just gonna take longer. So okay. I'm recommending a tank of gas uh, in a totally safe place before we do any driver's ed, a year on easy roads 
before okay. we do downtown traffic or crowded freeways. Uh, just a period of acclimation. It That's like. right. Okay. It's going to take longer. For multitasking skills in general, whether it's driving or... Well, multitasking or is the problem. You see, and the way to avoid the multitasking is there's no multitasking if the, the operation of the car is migrated out of frontal cortex back to the motor sure. cortex. So you don't have to think about driving the car. So you want that extra time. That's right. And then okay. turn signals. Well, you can practice that on even on my aunt's ranch, where the, we would go up to the mailbox. There was one turn to the mailbox mm -hmm. where I could practice a turn signal. Okay. Okay. So that's driving. That's now, right. Now they can get to the job. They've learned how to drive. They've had their practice at at manners at a young age and doing some of these informal jobs. Do you have specific advice for what we can tell adults with autism who feel like they've got the right skills to get Let's out into the workforce? Let's short circuit the interview process. Okay. Because when we were just talking about this at the tech conference I was just at sure. across the street with Special Assistant, that um, company, a, a tech company that hires people on the autism spectrum, and they were talking about how they got to short circuit the interview process, and and the way that I would do interviews is I simply show off my portfolio. I'd show okay. pictures of things I designed, drawings. Okay, if it's a programmer, it needs to show a computer in there. Here's, okay, here's some C++ that code and it does this, and I got some JavaScript and it does this, and you just show off your portfolio. So maybe a different kind of interview That's process right. for people That's on right. the spectrum. And then once they get on the job, the thing employers have to realize is you cannot be vague. There's a scene in the movie where my boss slammed down the deodorant and said, you stink, use it. That happened. Right. They got to clean up themselves, and I did it. And that boss, I'm pretty sure, was on the spectrum. But you that said you that. appreciated that. Now, I was, was very direct. angry at the time. I was very angry and upset at the time. Okay. But I wanted the job. I thank that boss now. And I thank Linda Carpenter and her other secretary friend that took me out to buy the clothes. OK. So are there things that you would recommend to employers that they can do to be more receptive to people a with autism? A lot of people on the spectrum are going to need a quiet place to work. Okay. You know, some of these restrooms have these horrible Dyson blade sure. air hand dryers. Now, if my office cube was next to that, I wouldn't be able to work. I've got I to, wouldn't either. I've got to get away from <laughs> that. And a and, uh, quiet place to work. Also, clearly define the tasks. Okay. Even now, I mean, I'm, I, when I do consulting, I've worked on a big manuscript with 15 other people. And I just said, I need homework. Okay, tell me I'll write this part of the manuscript, and I'll do it in this format, get it done on this date. Okay. Then, when I read through all the rest of the manuscript, I found some technical errors. You know, some things, there might be opinion. Mm -hmm. These were purely technical errors. Another person wrote, corrected them, no track changes, just sent it on in. Okay. Because you don't rub the other person's nose in their mistakes. Well, that's... Because I got in trouble for doing something. That's right. good practice anyway. Yeah. That's just nice, nice, uh, you know, social skills. Uh, so it sounds like then, to just recap it, for, for employers today to clearly define tasks for people on the that's spectrum right. who are coming into the workplace, that's a great way to be sensitive right, to helping them succeed. All right, let's say it's, a, it's programming. You don't just say develop new software. That's too vague. Right. They've got to write be some direct. code that does. You don't tell them how to write the code. That's up to the to the, the just, ASPE to do that. But what is the outcome? Okay, that's to go on a certain platform, be a certain language, sure. and it's got to achieve a certain outcome. Great. And there's some deadlines. Great. And deadlines. Okay. Well, when I worked for the magazine, the deadline was so many column inches by the 15th of each month. And and I was to cover a wide variety of livestock topics. Well, I think that that's great advice for for employers out there because it's been a big question, and I I know we we're out of time. We have to wrap up, but it's been great to talk to you about just the employment issue in general. My advice to employers as an attorney would be, give them a quiet place, give them the well-defined tasks. There's one task. other issue I want to talk about, and that's the that? video game addictions. I'm seeing way too many kids where uh, moms are coming to me and says he's 21, I can't get him out of the basement, and he's 18, okay. I can't get him out of the bedroom. Uh, we've got to limit the video game playing. Well, I think all parents sort of feel that way. And well, we've the, got to because they're not having good outcomes. The more, the more you limit the video games and the more you can do, like what you said, is to help socialize people. The more we spend one-on-one -on -one time like you and I have talking to each other face-to-face, -face, yep. the more we all benefit I'm by not, better social skills. I'm not suggesting banning video games, but the rule <laughs> for me was is one hour of TV during the week and two hours on Saturday, two hours on Sunday, so they can do it and that's some. A, and... That's and, a great uh, way to wrap it up. That, but would, that's great advice. You can't advice. let them play video games for eight hours a day. Well, of course not. Of course not. I think all parents would agree with you. But, but unfortunately, I'm seeing too many kids where that's happening.
Okay. Well, it's good advice. It's good advice if you want to be successful in the, the employment industry. The other thing industry. is you've got to expose kids to enough different things. Like, how's a kid going to find out he might like acting for a career if there's no school play? How's right. he going to find out he likes uh, oh my fixing gosh. cars if there's no auto shop? They've taken these things out of the schools. I think it's completely wrong. Kids are not getting exposed to enough different things to become careers. Okay. Okay. So lots of exposure. Gosh, thank you so okay. much, Temple. We appreciate your thank time. You. It's been fabulous. Thank you for joining us You're on The welcome. Future's Bright. So Temple, everybody's talking about this book. It's a, it's something that's very timely, especially for those of us who have kids that are teenagers or about to be teenagers. Tell our viewers what the new book is. Well, Deborah Moore, a psychologist out in California, came to me with the idea of doing this book. And one of the big things we wanted to talk about is the problem of certain kids on the autism spectrum getting addicted to video games. And I'm seeing some very bad outcomes. You know, like he's 23 years old, who's in the basement playing video games, and he doesn't do anything else. And Deborah Moore put together a great chapter in the Loving Push on video games. We also have some very nice first-person profiles of people on the spectrum being successful in jobs, which is a really, a, a really, really, a, a really good positive thing. I can't emphasize enough the importance of kids getting jobs when they're in high school. Even volunteer jobs at the church or anything, they've got to learn that discipline and responsibility of having a job. You've got to be there on time. You've got to be reliable. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I was cleaning horse stalls. When I was 13 years old, I loved that selling job. I'm seeing too many smart kids on the spectrum that are not learning how to work. Yeah, and, and I love the idea, Temple. You talk about this a lot, about how we can't just expect them to be ready for a job suddenly, miraculously, when they turn 18, that there's a whole process that we have to do to help them to be ready, and that, that we used to do this all the time, that I certainly, I had to do jobs, odd jobs around the neighborhood well before I was at an age where I was eligible for a job, and you did as well, right? Well, when I was 13, mother got me a little sewing job, and when I was even younger, I'd washed a few cars. It's important to have a slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. I'm seeing too often where a child uh, on the spectrum graduates from college, and he has never had a job of any kind of a job. And so if you have a kid in high school, uh, I want to get him out working. He can be in the informal economy when he's young. As soon as he's 14, 16, I want to get a real job just to learn work skills. If you have a, individuals in college right now, they need to be doing career-relevant summer internships. I, I worked at a research lab. It was an unpaid internship where I, um, I did uh, work on experiments on rats, actually, and mice. And I had to rent a house with another lady, and it was just set up in the neighborhood. They've got to learn working skills, and that ought to happen before they graduate from school. Yeah. Well, I love the idea of internships, and you and I had an opportunity to talk a couple of weeks ago about um, summer camp situations, because I was sharing with you that I'm, I'm having a really hard time finding a summer camp that I think is advantageous for my son, who's really into tech things, and you had some great ideas about making it happen in the neighborhood, and I wondered if you'd share some of that with our viewers. Well, let's just look at things. You know, we have a huge shortage in this country right now, car mechanics and diesel mechanics. Well, maybe some retired mechanic needs to st set up a small engine repair class to just do with middle school kids so they can find out engines are cool. You know, a lot of schools have taken out hands-on classes. Now, in Texas, I know that some of the places, they're putting that back in again. But how are students going to find out what they want to do for a career if they're not exposed? I get asked all the time, how would I get interested in the cattle industry? Because I was exposed to cattle when I was 15. That's how I got interested in them. Yeah, and, and so I love this idea that if, if we can't find the camp, uh, you were suggesting me make it happen myself. You really lit a fire in me and inspired me. And I, I think what a great idea. For, for families, though, and you talk about this, the loving push. This is not about being mean, but about being loving and caring. This is what we do to raise our kids. What do you suggest if a parent is sitting there this summer and they've got a 15-year-old, 
they're not quite sure how to go about getting their kid an odd job or getting something happening in the neighborhood. What do you suggest? Well, Mother just found the sewing job. She just saw a sign on a lady's house that said, you know, sit freelance seamstress, and she just went in and offered up my skills. She knew I was good at hand sewing. It was just done in the neighborhood. The internship at the research lab was just done in the neighborhood. It set up to the people that, uh, uh, that, you know, that were there yeah. in the school and with my mother. We, we're here at the show, we're really loving, there's a new show on the Oprah Winfrey Network that's called For Pete's Sake, and it's Holly Robinson, Pete, and her family. She's got a 17-year-old son who's on the spectrum, and in the most recent episode, both she and her husband took their son to businesses that they frequent and said to the business owner, hey, have you got something here for our child? Is there, you know, can you show him what you do here? I just thought that was really proactive of them, that they didn't wait for somebody to approach them. They went to the business. Do you think that's a good well, idea? That's the, I told that's the thing to do. I ask parents all the time, what do you know, shopkeepers, you know, especially independent businesses, just do something in the neighborhood. And that sewing job is a perfect example of just setting it up in the neighborhood. Yeah, and it seems, as you said, in high schools anymore, there used to be vocational training, and there isn't uh, anymore. But um, so in, instead of waiting for the schools to bring it back, you had talked to me about the, the all-important lawnmower a couple of weeks ago and how lawnmowers, uh, old lawnmowers are around and even learning how to repair a lawnmower is something that's a great skill for kids. Well, it gets a kid interested in engines. He's going to find out that the engine's interesting. And that lawnmower could then go on and turn into an auto mechanics class. See, the problem is, is that all of those vocational things have moved to the community college. But that's almost too late. We need to be getting these kids hooked on, on some of these uh, skilled trades and vocational things before they graduate from high school. Absolutely, absolutely. And then I wondered if we could take just a second to talk with you, Dr. Grannon, about inclusion and how you feel about it. There's a big push right now that a lot of schools have started specific programs that are just for kids with autism where they're putting them someplace else on campus. Likewise, now, what age of kids are you talking about? I'm talking about junior, you know, from kindergarten all the way up through high school. Um, and, I'm, and then there are other schools that are making a big push for inclusion, having everybody in the classroom together. And I, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about either of those models. Well, sometimes the correct thing to do for a particular kid is something in between. But I'll tell you something I don't want to see. I walk into a brand new autism school, and you've got four or five very severely handicapped kids in a room, and then they're sitting amongst them as a 12-year-old that should definitely not be there, fully verbal, just messing around on a computer. Uh, he maybe, maybe possibly be, should be in a gifted class. That's what I don't want to see. The autism is turning into such a broad spectrum that I'm seeing too many of the Asperger type of kids held behind when they ought to be working for NASA. I've talked to a lot of people at NASA. I know there's people there that are sort of mildly on the spectrum. All right, so one kind of geeky kid gets to go work for NASA or Google, and another geeky kid's playing video games in the basement on Social Security, and they're the same geeky kid. Yeah. See, I don't get hung up on the labels. I'm seeing the people. I see them as I talk about it. Yeah, I, I, I got to say, I think that you, you've got such an insight in this area, Dr. Grandin, and I, I, I would love to, you know, see some of these programs spring up that can fill this gap in a way that's really affordable for families. I think that an industrious parent know, knows how to get this started, but um, but uh, there are a lot of parents that probably need some help getting these things started. And if, if well, they just sort of, they, you know, the other thing I've found is I've worked for 20 years in the construction industry. I would design a project, then I'd supervise its construction. And one thing I learned is how do you get things done? Like if you ran out of parts, we got on the phone and called and called. Now today you get on the Internet and search and search, they found the parts. It, it, it's there's an urgency. How do you get it done? Yeah. It's the problem solving that I think is missing. We talk about teaching critical thinking in high schools and junior highs, but if it's not practical and hands-on, I don't, I don't know that the lesson really gets taught. Well, hands-on things. I remember in sewing, and I loved sewing when I, was in, when I was in elementary school, and I cut some fabric wrong in a wrecked project. And I learned from that that you, you uh, don't rush. Some other time you might make a mistake, and then you just have to figure out something, some other way to do it. When I made bird kites that I flew behind my tripe when I was really little, 
by experiment and experiment and experiment with his bird kites. Uh, hands on things teach practical problem solving. And I think a lot of people today don't know how to do practical problem solving because they haven't done any hands on things. Yeah, no, it's true. And we and we, and a lot of times I, I love that the book talks about how we're gonna have to push our kids because I think a lot of people, myself included, I have coddled my kid. You pointed that out to me this fall. Uh, we, we went to lunch together and you, I, I was not letting my son use the restroom by himself and you took, you went up one side of me and down the other. And he's very grateful to you, Dr. Grandin. Uh, and you know what? He just got right up and he used it. He did. And uh, whenever I'm being too much of a smother now, he threatens to call you because um, he knows that you're on his side. And that's good. You know, I think parents need well, that. I knew that at that barbecue restaurant, that restaurant was going to be perfectly safe. Yes. Uh, and he had such a good time with you that day, I have to say. Now, I wonder, as we're, we're getting ready to, to be in April, Autism Awareness Month, and um, a lot of people are going to be talking about autism. And already this week, there's been a lot in the news talking about autism. And, and, and there's a, a discussion about what the discussion should be. And I'd like to hear from you, Dr. Grannon, about what do you think the discussion about autism should be right now? Well, I'm very concerned about how broad the spectrum is. And I don't want to see a smart, geeky kid who maybe should work for Google going down the wrong track. You see, the problem is, when you just think about it in the language, you get locked into the label. See, one advantage of being a visual thinker is I see a geeky kid at a gifted conference, then I go over to an autism conference, they're the same geeky kid. And then I go to a tech company and I see 10 years older, it's the same kind of geeky kid, I want to see them get into those good jobs. And then you've got another end of the spectrum where they're very severely handicapped, they're not going to work for Google. You see, this is the problem we've got with the autism diagnosis. It's so broad. Yeah. Going from someone who remains with very severe handicaps to somebody that ought to be in a gifted program, but they're socially awkward. This is one of the things that's a real problem. Now, when it comes to early intervention, that's one place where that's really improved. You've got three-year-olds that are not talking. You've got to start working on that kid and working on him right now. Yeah, I, I, I so agree with you about the huge wide spectrum. And I know I promised you that we weren't going to keep you very long. So I, I want to I want to thank you for being with us. Um, and uh, we're we're going to close out of the recording. But then I'm going to ask you to stay on the line with me for just one quick second when we're done. But thank you so much. And and just a last question for you, Dr. Grannon. Do you do anything particular in the month of April to commemorate Autism Awareness Month? I've got a ton of uh, speaking engagements. Well, and that is such a great service to our community. You always enlighten us. You always lift us up. And um, we thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you very much for having me. I gotta do the U turn around the, the thing? Okay. So, Kelby, do I want the north entry or the south, or does it matter? Okay. Are we doing curbside bag check? Which way, Kelby? Left? Yeah. Kelby, can I go through the T? Yeah, I, I have a toll tag. Can you go through the T? Okay. What do you do that? Like you could just have spend two hours doing and have it suck all your time. Oh, I like to look up research, interesting research articles on animal behavior. <clears throat> Found a really interesting, really interesting uh, European papers on how wolves are different than dogs that I read last oh. week that were very, very interesting. Very cool. Because I've always talked about a brain can be more social, emotional. Or a brain can be more cognitive. Yeah. And the wolf turns out to be more cognitive. And we've bred the dog to be more social emotional. How fascinating is that? Very, very interesting. The wolves are very good at watching another wolf solve a problem. We were talking a little bit about television before, and I cannot believe that what you said to me, what 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 you like to watch on television. Star Trek. <laughs> I was a Star Trek fan when I was a teenager. I liked the Star Trek Next Generation. I was watching that when I was working on my PhD in the eighties. And so what... Total Star Trek fan. What's your favorite series, and what's your favorite character, and what's your favorite uh, Mr. episode? Mr. Spock was my favorite character. Love it. And uh, what's favorite episode? This oh, guy is going to hate me. Uh, 
there was a lot of good. My favorite Star Trek movie was the one with the whales. Yes. Yeah, I really like that Star Trek movie. And so sad that we lost Leonard Nimoy this year. Yeah. So are you, I didn't know that you like to watch television. Do you like to go to the movies too? Oh yeah, so I went and saw Gravity. There's certain movies that have to be seen in a theater, like yeah. Gravity and Avatar. Yeah. I wanted to see Inside Out in the theater. That I really liked that movie. What did you think of that? I liked it. I think it. I think about how all the emotions interact. I gotta be honest. I had said after that that I thought that it was going to be a great tool for for people to show kids on the autism spectrum about perspective taking yeah about what it's like in other people's heads well no it's more like how the emotions inside your own head sort of conflict with each other yeah absolutely so I love the Wizard of Oz and I love the idea of the wizard of the ruby slippers she had the way back home she just didn't know she had it yeah you see and I think that's a metaphor for a lot of things a lot of people have the ruby slippers but they don't know they have them they don't know they have the key they can open up the door to a lot of really great stuff so what would you say was your ruby slipper well, I had when some opportunities came up, like when I designed those dip vats, um, that was a major uh, breakthrough for my business. Really? And when the head of the feed yard came up to me and asked me if I'd do it, I said, give me three weeks. You know, a lot of people would have been too scared to walk through the door. Now, this is pre-internet, and I knew it would take me three weeks to get some of the information I needed, especially on concrete reinforcement, to design the dip vats. But you did it. I did it. I was on the phone the next day to the USDA to get the drawings on the concrete reinforcement. Wow. So I, I want to journey back to childhood for just a second and talk about friends because a lot of times people ask about friends. Who was your best friend? When I was in elementary school, one of my best friends was a girl named Eleanor. And she was the first girl in elementary school to get the tape wood shop instead of cooking. And I was the second girl in our school to get the tape wood shop. So we like to make stuff. It's all about making stuff. And I had good friends in high school, even though I got bullied and teased, I got friends who shared interests, riding horses together, doing electronics together, doing model rockets together, doing stuff together with other, um, with other students. So you found, like your mom says about, found, you found your tribe. Yeah, and yeah. you've got to get them in yeah. doing things with other people. And you did a lot of theater, and you, did you sing as a kid? Yeah, I did. I, one of the problems I was singing is I couldn't synchronize my rhythm with somebody else's rhythm. Do you still have a hard time doing that? I still have a hard time doing that. Because we were, we were going to ask you if you wanted to sing something in the car with us. Well, I think maybe we'll skip the <laughs> great question. But the one question people always ask us is they want to know if you've ever been in love. No, never have. And, and you don't feel like you're missing anything. I've seen so much turmoil in so many marriages that I haven't really seen a situation that would be a good model. And yet you gave me really good marriage advice. Because I'm a good problem solver. You have to like take the problem and cut it down. And in engineering you have to find the root cause of a problem. What do you think is your secret to your success as a teacher? Well, presenting things really clearly. Yeah. That's really important. Making things interesting. I think it's also important that it's something in a class that you know a student can take home and use. I teach a class in cattle behavior and handling, and I've got a lot of students that are pre-vet that are going to go in the dog and cat, probably won't be handling any cattle. But I said, you want to design this corral system because it's visual problem solving. You have to figure out how to do it. It's not a cookbook. And then I have my internet project where they can pick out anything in animal behavior, and I make them dig into a narrow subject that I have to approve because I want them digging into Google Scholar and PubMed Science Direct and the other databases. They gotta learn how to find stuff online and I'm finding about two thirds of the students are not very good at that. How about this, Make Magazine. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that a lot of kids on the spectrum need to be doing, the cool stuff in here. Really interesting. Make Magazine is gonna love that you Make did magazine. that. Make Magazine, that's a <laughs> wonderful magazine. A and I'm, Okay, yes, yes and, and they're resurrecting old satellites from mission control and an abandoned McDonald's. Love That's it. the kind of stuff I really like. These are the kind of magazines we need to get in the school. Make Absolutely. Magazine, Business Week, Science, Nature, Wired. we got to show kids out there. There's all kinds of super interesting yeah. stuff out there. Open but if the they brain. don't see it, then they don't know about it. Yeah, I like nice. to geek out on construction oh, sites. Yeah. I like to salivate over all the equipment they've got that we didn't have, like really cool man lifts and 
you know, nice scaffolding. We didn't have any of that stuff. And you didn't? No, we didn't. What did you guys have? Horrid, a compass? A horrid ladder, so we're really dangerous <laughs> is what we have. your stuff out. Yep. Back up. Oh. We have to get the mic back from you too. Oh, you took it off already. You're good. I'm attached to mine. What is it like for you personally to have become the most celebrated person in the field of autism? Well, I feel it's a responsibility. I get a lot of emails and letters from young kids. In fact, at the last conference I was at, I got a whole envelope of uh, letters from kids in an English class. What makes me pleased is I think I'm inspiring a lot of kids to succeed because I want to see kids succeed. Now, one problem I'm seeing with some of the fully verbal kids is they're not getting stretched enough. I see kids coming up to me at conferences where nobody's taught them how to shake hands. See, when I was a young child, I had to be party host at my mother's parties. I had to shake hands, say please and thank you, have table manners, learn how to shop. And I'm seeing too many situations where they aren't learning those basic skills. Yeah, so you, you really think they need the basic skills that every child should learn. Yes, now in the 50s, every child was taught social skills in a much more structured way. And today, that's not the case. Now, the so-called normal kids, they pick it up. But the autistic kids have got to be taught. Okay. And that's not being done enough. What kind of preconceptions, though, do you think most people have about relating to those with ASD? Autism is a really big spectrum. You're going all the way from Silicon Valley down to somebody with a lot of intellectual challenges. Now, the kinds of services and things a person needs is very different those two ends of the spectrum. And I go to different places, I go to Silicon Valley, I see a lot of people that I know are on the spectrum, and then I go see another kid that's smart at math, but nothing's being done to develop his skills and he's getting addicted to video games. And they are the same kind of kid. The thing that I'm seeing, especially on the mild end of the spectrum, is too many kids sort of becoming the label. I'm very concerned about them getting a handicap mentality. Then I go over to the meatpacking plant, and there's a whole maintenance shop of old hippies that I know are on the spectrum and they run that maintenance shop and they've been there for years and years and years. Why do you think the numbers, one in 68 now, have risen so dramatically? I think on the mild end of the spectrum it's increased detection. Because I can think of kids I went to elementary school with, kids I went to college with, that today would be diagnosed on the spectrum. I think that's a big part of it on the mild end of the spectrum. Now I think there also is some severe autism that may have actually increased because there's more environmental contaminants and there's more medications uh, being given uh, during early pregnancy. Dr. Grant, and you beg parents not to let their children with autism be defined by the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Why? Well, I think the DSM made a big mistake removing Asperger's syndrome because under the DMS-4, autism you had to have speech delay Asperger was no speech delay. Now, you could argue scientific reasons for taking out the speech delay stuff, but from a service provider standpoint, you know, the kind of services that somebody's nonverbal as is different than a mild kid with Asperger's. And I'm seeing too many fully verbal kids, less severe than me, getting put into a class with uh, nonverbal kids. I'm seeing too many smart kids uh, not learning job skills. That's another thing that I really push, because when I was 13, my mother had got me in a sewing job. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. Uh, it's really important that students intern in a job before they graduate from high school. They gotta learn that discipline of um, getting to work. If you could speak to every business owner in America, what would you say to convince them to hire somebody on the autism spectrum? Well, there are certain things they can do extremely well. In fact, the SAP Corporation is hiring people with autism. There's another um, project, Project Search, where they, um, there's work being done with collaborating with hospitals to train them to set up surgical in instruments for different types of surgery. And they take longer to train, but once they're trained, they're super, super good and meticulous about making sure the instruments are set up right. And that's got about a 78% uh, 
uh, employment rate. So you think the skills that those with ASD have to offer are often overlooked by people well, that I can, employ? Well, as I said before, I can think of kids that I went to college with that definitely were on the autism spectrum. Those individuals are all employed in good jobs. And I think a lot of this gets back to pounding those manners in, in the 50s and the 60s, and kids being on things like paper routes, where they learned work skills. Why do you think the experts in the field of ASDs focus so intensely on the deficits and not on the strengths of Well, autism? we need to be building up strengths. My ability in art was always encouraged. And I was encouraged to do lots of different kinds of art. If you've got a third grader that's good at math, and he can do a high school math book, let him do the high school math book. Don't hold them back. I want to know why you think that so little attention has been paid to the sensory processing issues. What can we learn from those? Well, I just heard about a brand new study that's been done up at the uh, in California, Dr. Wu, and they took um, children aged 4 through 12 that had speech delay, and they stayed in their regular programs, ABA or whatever the speech therapy the school was doing, and then they got an hour a day of sensory therapy where they did a lot of variety of stimulation, like walk on different kinds of flooring, smell different smells, do different activities in a mirror, big variety, always doing more than one sensory thing at a time. And it was done as a controlled experiment, where half the kids just got the regular treatment and the other half got this added sensory treatment. And they got some really big, significant improvements. And they made the point of using all very inexpensive things that would be in any house. There's so much division in the autism community. How do you think we can all come together and well, find a common ground? I think that merging Asperger's together with autism has made all of this worse. Because you have a segment of very, very severely handicapped kids where they're never gonna be able to live independently. That's a very different kind of situation than a mild Asperger's type of kid. You see, you're, you're, you're putting too many apples and oranges together. Every other diagnosis, like dyslexia, learning problems, ADHD, you've got a fully verbal kid. Only in autism right now are you getting a range going from, you know, smart computer geek down to somebody who has very, very severe challenges. Now, I think the American Psychiatric Association originally figured the Asperger kids would get into this social communication category. That's not what's happening. Nobody's going into that because there's no funding for it. As the most admired person in this field, and we are literally becoming an autism nation, what do you think the most important thing is for us to be aware of? Well, there's a point where personality variants are just normal variation. I think a brain can be made more cognitive and thinking, or a brain can be made more social. Now, at what point does that become abnormal? There's no black and white dividing line. I'm getting concerned that what we're saying is abnormal is is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Obviously, a child that has severe speech delay, that's an abnormality. But when you take the kids that are just kind of socially awkward, a lot of those kids are really smart. And then you got the person that's a total social butterfly. And let's think back to the caveman days. I don't think the social yak yaks around the campfire made the first stone spear. <laughs> Dr. Grandin, thank you for inspiring okay. all of us as parents and children. <laughs>